What if you could get diamonds from the sky? Green tech company Sky Mining says they're doing just that by using excess carbon dioxide to make a fully certified diamond. This is what we call our Sky Mining Works. This is where we mine the sky. Mine the sky. Yeah. Ten years ago, environmentalist Dale Vince, which I just find astonishing and ultimately extraordinarily romantic, sky diamonds. I mean, just tell, tell us all about that. I mean, it is, I, I, just, for me, it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It led me to the thought that the most permanent form of carbon known to mankind is a diamond. And I would put the two together and thought what a, how amazing it would be if we could pull carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into a diamond as a permanent way to lock it up. This creates what they call the world's first truly carbon negative fuel. So what does that really mean? Essentially, it's a profitable way to remove CO2 emissions from the atmosphere and recycle the carbon inside that CO2 to make sustainable diamonds. Just on a mission, creating bling without the environmental sting. For me, it's like uh, modern alchemy. And when I had the idea, I just thought it sounded amazing and I just had to try and find a way to do it. Oh, wow, that's a really cool idea. Let's take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into diamonds. I mean, that's like taking a greenhouse gas and turning it into something that's super valuable. I mean, why didn't no one think of this before? Oh boy, oh, where to start? Well, I'm not sure how old you are, but over the years, you must have noticed, you know, your chest going up and down, that sort of thing. And the reason you could do that is you've got to pump gas over a gas exchange membrane that takes the oxygen out of the air and absorbs it into your body, where your body uses it to fuel its metabolism. Then, of course, you breathe out some CO2. So your body is constantly excreting carbon dioxide. So let's use that as a yardstick to see just how great sky diamonds will be for the environment. Awesome. So this here is carbon dioxide, solid carbon dioxide. That's the gas that you breathe out once it gets down to about minus 70, minus 80, that sort of thing. It's pretty chilly. So I've got a question. How much of this do you actually excrete per day? You know, just by staying alive, breathing in and out, how much would that look like? And, you know, one step further, how much is your carbon footprint if you were to take a look at all the energy that you consume per day in terms of, you know, driving cars or heating or electricity, all that sort of thing? How much carbon dioxide does that produce? Well, we're going to answer the first question first, which is how much do you, as a, you know, just by breathing in and out, produce per day? And now what your body does is it takes oxygen, that's this stuff here, the gas, and it, it burns either carbohydrate, which is like sugar, or um, some sort of oil, like this over here, to produce uh, carbon dioxide, stuff in the background, and water. Now the rough dimensions um, I'll give you, you need about a kilo of sugar per day just to keep you alive and i don't quite have a kilo here but it just does give you a feel of this is like that would just about keep you alive for a day <laughs> if that's that's what you need you need this right without this you slowly starve now it turns out oil is a lot more energy dense than sugar but your body can kind of burn it in a similar way and so you need about a third of a kilo of oil third to half a kilo that sort of thing of oil is what you need per day so that will also run your body for about a day and this also by the way is why dieting is so slow and so hard because if i starve myself completely I eat nothing for the entire day. That's the maximum amount of my body weight that I can excrete if I don't do anything differently. Okay? So, at best, a steep diet is usually you eat one third less, which means that uh, I would only burn off about a third of this 
per day, which is about 100 grams, is a really steep diet. Um, and that's why dieting takes so long. And there are no shortcuts around it because this is what your body does, is it breathes in the oxygen and it uses it to burn stuff. So we know roughly how much sugar or oil we need. So we'll, we'll take a look at some, not liquid oxygen, it turns out liquid oxygen is uh, fiercely, fiercely oxidizing uh, to the point where it's really quite dangerous. Uh, things burn very impressively with liquid oxygen. However, liquid nitrogen has virtually identical properties in terms of boiling point, density, all that sort of thing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get some liquid oxygen and just put it in my cup here. Can you see that? Okay, let's just let that boil down for a bit. So you see, it's got a density, it turns out, that's fairly comparable to water. It's slightly lower, but it's, it's fairly comparable. And once it's cooled down the cup, you'll see it's an insulated cup, by the way. So, uh, so there you go. This is about a well. Okay, let, let, let's round up here. It's actually about a quarter of a liter, but we'll call it a third of a liter just to make our numbers easy. And yeah, he looks kind of awesome there. So if you're taking your oxygen and liquefied it, this is what it would look like. It looks slightly bluer, but in terms of absolute amounts of oxygen that you need, you need about three of these per day. Okay, so let's just top these guys up. Awesome. So that is how much oxygen your body needs to stay alive every day in terms of mass. And what your body does with that is it'll burn about a kilo of sugar. And I did an experiment very much like this a few years back, just to give you some idea of how much power your body gets through in a day. Whether it's eaten and enzymatically converted into carbon dioxide and water by your metabolism or oxidized by chemical oxygen makes relatively little difference to the amount of energy released. This fireball is releasing about every 10 seconds the energy that your body consumes in a day. About every 10 seconds, it's releasing the amount of carbon dioxide you generate in a day. About a fifth of that energy goes to fueling your brain, the very brain which is currently processing the fury of the mammalian metabolism. So you've got a choice, you can either burn a kilo of sugar or yeah, half to a third of a kilo of oil, either or. And from that, your body is going to make about a kilo of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is actually pretty dense stuff. It's about three times as dense as water. So my guess is this is going to be on the heavy side. And it is, it's about one and a half kilos. So if I was keen, I would chop that down by about a third. In fact, let's, let's, let's try that. The tip. Right, I'm gonna do it on the floor. That should hopefully work better. Beautiful. Awesome. So there we go. That's about how much carbon dioxide your body makes per day. Ho oh, ho! He aims for a kilo. Yeah, it gets pretty close. Super. So that's how much carbon dioxide in terms of mass your body makes per day. So this is now gloriously what your body does every day. It's about a kilo of oxygen burns a kilo of sugar to make a kilo of carbon dioxide and a kilo of water. So if you breathe out about a kilo of carbon dioxide per day, that means you're breathing out about one gram of carbon dioxide per minute. It means that you're actually lighter now than when you started watching the video. But how much lighter are you now? Well, it's about 10 minutes you've been watching this video, so you're about 10 grams lighter. This, uh, that, that's what carbon dioxide does when it gets warm, by the way. That's about 20 odd grams there, so it's about half of that. So we just need to chop this guy down a bit and... 
There we go, super. So that's, no, that's the heavy one. Okay, that's about right. That's how much lighter you are now than when you started watching this video. Now, you might be wondering how we know all of this, and the answer is because NASA sent men to the moon, or well, three men to the moon in one of these guys. Uh, this is the command module from the Apollo program. Um, and the thing is, if you're sending three men to the moon, you need to know how much oxygen you're going to put in there, and you need to know how much carbon dioxide you've got to scrub out of the atmosphere, because otherwise you put people in a small space like this, the carbon dioxide buildup kills them quicker than anything else. So this is how we know what people need per day in terms of how much oxygen they need and how much carbon dioxide they breathe out. So if you breathe out about one kilo of carbon dioxide per day, then obviously that means you breathe out about 365 kilos of carbon dioxide per year. That means your normal person is breathing out like four to five times their own body weight of carbon dioxide per year. You know, give or take, it's half a ton, that sort of thing. But that's just to keep you alive. If you want to include in there all of the carbon dioxide from a first world lifestyle, and then it goes up by about a factor of 10. So most European countries are about five tons per year. Why now, what would five tons of carbon dioxide look like? Interesting question. Glad you asked. This is a fairly sensible way to store your carbon dioxide, which is outside, because if you store it on the inside, carbon dioxide in confined spaces is fairly toxic. So you really don't want to be sticking your head in there and breathing or anything. But and just to give you a feel, a uh, cubic meter, that's about one meter. So up to about here and all the way to the bottom is about a cubic meter. A cubic meter of water weighs about a ton-ish. If that was full of carbon dioxide, it would be about yeah, three, four tons sort of thing. So, you know, when these guys are full, they take about yeah, six tons. And that's for a, a fairly efficient European type country. In America, it's almost twice that amount. So that would be like two of these containers full per year is the carbon dioxide footprint for the energy requirements of your typical American per year. Good. So now we can see just how impressive these uh, sky diamonds mined from the sky truly are. We don't need to mine the earth now for diamonds. We can mine the sky. And I, I see it as a kind of 21st century piece of technology. Uh, we can fight the climate crisis with it. These accredited sky diamonds, around two million Australian dollars worth here, are physically and chemically identical to those mined from the earth. And this is where it all crashes and burns on every conceivable level. Firstly, chemical vapor deposition diamonds like they've got here are nothing new. The cost of making the diamonds is rapidly moving towards basically just the energy costs of making the diamonds. So when they say it's worth about $2 million. It's around $2 million Australian dollars worth here. That's pretty much the energy cost of making those diamonds. And to me, it looks like maybe yeah, 200 grams of diamond. You know, diamonds have a comparable density to carbon dioxide. So yeah, maybe 200 grams, that sort of thing. Now it should be stressed that carbon dioxide, only about a third of it is carbon by mass. You know, with the other two thirds being oxygen. So this means that they've sequestered in these diamonds about half a kilogram of carbon dioxide. That's about as much carbon dioxide as you get in a soda stream canister. So you now have a choice. You can spend about two million dollars to reduce your carbon footprint by about how much you would breathe out in half a day. Or you can buy a soda stream canister for about thirty dollars. Both pull about the same amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now at this point it might be worth reflecting on why diamonds were so expensive in the first place. These rocks don't lose their shape. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Now initially, of course, it's because they were rare and we couldn't make them. So the only place you could get them was to mine them out of the earth. Now the thing is that diamonds are thought to originate very deep down in the earth where there's lots of pressure and the temperature is very high, about two to 300 kilometers down. 
And just to put that into perspective, the deepest human holes are about 10 kilometers deep. So it's thought that the diamonds form deep down in the earth. So how do they get to the surface? Nothing from that deep in the earth comes to the surface. Well, it hasn't done for quite some time. You see, there are these things called kimberlite pipes. They're thought to be very ancient volcanoes that came from very deep within the earth. Thing is, there really hasn't been one, you know, on the sort of million year time scale. And so when you got these volcanic eruptions from very deep in the earth, they carried up some diamonds with them. And those are the only natural diamonds we know about on the surface, you know, beyond the niche things like meteor impacts and all that sort of thing. Now, for me, the whole sparkly thing of diamonds doesn't do that much for me. However, knowing that a diamond originated deep within the earth and came up in one of these very violent volcanic eruptions a long time ago, that's kind of interesting. Now, it turns out mankind is actually fairly ingenious in working out how to do things like this. So over the years, we've found at least two ways of making diamonds. The first is you get these very large, high pressure, high temperature presses. And the second one, which is much more recent, is chemical vapor deposition diamonds. Pumps inject hydrogen and methane gas, and the machine heats them to thousands of degrees. The gases form a plasma, which rains onto the diamond wafers and causes them to grow. After just two weeks, the diamond slivers have grown into stones at least 10 times the original size. Which is still pretty expensive and pretty fiddly. So one way you might think of chemical vapor deposition diamonds is with some dry ice and the air. Now the air contains water. And when those water molecules that are in the air as gas hit the surface of the dry ice, they condense and they form crystals, ice crystals. And this is how chemical vapor deposition diamonds basically work. Instead of water in the air, it's carbon in the air at you know over a thousand degrees or so, and you're slowly condensing it on to something that's cooler. So I'll leave that for five minutes and see what happens. So that we have some crystals, if only the camera will do its magic. Cool. So that's kind of what chemical vapor deposition diamonds are. And if I just blow on this, you will see that they're, they're not held on by much. Cool. So if you do it quickly, you tend to get crap. If you want to get a single crystal diamond out at the end, you've got to do this very slowly. That's why these chemical vapor deposition diamonds typically take a couple of weeks to grow. After just two weeks, the diamond slivers have grown into stones at least 10 times the original size. And all the time that you're doing that, you've got to have this thing heated at about a thousand degrees Celsius. All the time while maintaining the exact atmosphere by injecting the right gases into the chamber, which is still pretty expensive. So with the chemical vapor deposition diamonds, you're essentially growing the diamonds out of the gas, and it's super fiddly to get the conditions right. But if you do, you can grow single crystal diamonds of really quite variable sizes. Now, chemical vapor deposition has come on in leaps and bounds in recent years, but it's still pretty expensive. These are kind of the cheapest CBD diamonds you can get, and they're about $50 per gram, and this is what they look like. That's still about the price of gold. Now, if you move up to the bigger things like gemstones or scientific applications like windows, the price jumps to about one to $3,000 per gram. And if you want to get your diamond mined out of the ground of comparable quality, you're talking almost 10 times that price now. 15 oh, carats. That is incredible. Okay, so let's talk money. How much is this? 150,000. Okay, so if that was natural, million and a bit? Yes, yes. So yeah, CVD diamonds is really quite impressive now. It's still a slow and expensive process, but it has made diamonds a lot cheaper. 
So eventually, this is all, of course, just going to equilibrate out with the market in terms of the energy costs of making the diamonds and, of course, the costs of people selling the diamonds. But even at that, the cheapest, crappiest diamonds that you can make at the moment are about the price of gold. <laughs> this is not a cost-effective way of storing carbon. I mean, none of this is as effective as just, say, pumping your carbon dioxide into a hole in the ground. Pfft, impossible, I hear you say. If you pump the gas into the ground, what's to stop it coming out again? Well, when we mine for gas, you drill a hole in the ground and you get into these airtight caverns and you vent the gas out, which you can then burn to create power and that sort of thing. Actually, I should stress at this point, they're not really caverns as such. They're more like banks of sand where there used to be lots of gas stored in the void between the sand particles. After you've exhausted the gas supply, you can pump your carbon dioxide back into the same holes where the gas had previously been stable for millions of years. After all, if you want to be serious about this, you've got to look at a way of storing about six tons of carbon dioxide per person per year. And I think the one thing that we can all agree on is making a handful of diamonds at an energy cost of about $2 million is kind of dumb. Now, our hero here does go on to say that these air-mined diamonds will reduce the environmental cost of mining diamonds. 21st century industry to me, one that takes something we have too much of, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and turns it into something that we like to have, diamonds, and we can avoid the pollution and the impact of digging the ground for those. What we've found is it's got a bigger role to play in the avoided emission of carbon by making stones a different way. Well, uh, yeah, but chemical deposition diamonds has been doing that for, for years. You know, long before this guy tacked on the idea of getting the carbon dioxide from the air. Seriously, to make his $2 million of diamonds, he needs to remove about a single soda stream bottle of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Then do the wonderfully eco-friendly act of putting about $2 million worth of energy into making these diamonds. Diamonds are just one part of the plan. Dale is also the multi-millionaire founder of Britain's greenest energy company and the chairman of the world's first green football club. Well, one of the first things that he tells people is to watch out for people bogusly selling things that pretend to be green. Are you being greenwashed? Greenwashing, claiming something is greener than it really is, has become a bit of a thing in the energy market. We don't need to mine the earth now for diamonds, we can mine the sky. And I, I see it as a kind of 21st century piece of technology. Uh, we can fight the climate crisis with it. Some energy suppliers claim green credentials for themselves or for some of their tariffs, but scratch the surface and they're not quite what they seem. Mining, I guess they think of what's going on, lots of activity, things that they can see. It's kind of an odd concept to be mining something you actually can't see. What if you could get diamonds from the sky? Green tech company Sky Mining says they're doing just that. Energy companies engage in three levels of green activity, ranging from the superficial to the impactful. He also seems to get confused between diamonds being hard and being chemically stable. It led me to the thought that the most permanent form of carbon known to mankind is a diamond. And I put the two together and thought what a, how amazing it would be if we could pull carbon out of the atmosphere turned it into a diamond as a permanent way to lock it up. And, and the thought struck me that the most permanent form of carbon known to mankind is a diamond. And, and then I had the idea, what if we could take carbon from the atmosphere, something we have too much of, and we could make diamonds with it? Yeah, diamonds are harder. They're not chemically more stable. And this is why we don't have diamonds on the surface. It's also not entirely clear he understands what stable actually means. So, for instance, some 70 million years ago, there was a load of sea life that pulled carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and made it into their shells in the form of calcium carbonate. And then when they died, that calcium carbonate sunk to the bottom and formed a layer, which then turned into chalk. And this is where we get the name Cretaceous from. It means Latin for chalk. That means that these chalk deposits have been sat like this for about 70 million years years. It led me to the thought that the most permanent form of carbon known to mankind is a diamond. All the time holding that carbon dioxide. So how is that not stable? I mean, at this point, 
just pumping it into a hole in the ground that was stable for the last 50 million years. How is that any less permanent? But even if you insisted on storing your carbon, not as, say, calcium carbonate or as carbon dioxide in wells or something, but as, say, for instance, actual elemental carbon, the fact that diamond is harder is almost an irrelevance. You would actually be much better off storing it as graphite because it's more stable and about a thousand times cheaper to produce. So if you enjoyed that, drop a thumbs up on it and definitely hit the subscribe button if you don't want to miss out on more great uploads like this one. And if anyone's interested in the glasses that I was using for the liquid nitrogen, well, it's not just the CVD diamonds that have come on in leaps and bounds recently. These aren't anything special. These are the glasses off Amazon. So it's got to be said that Thermos technology has come on quite a bit. Ooh, chilly on the feet, chilly on the feet. To the point where you can get these glasses now. I mean, they really are. Uh, it used to be that to get glasses like this would cost an absolute fortune. And uh, now, I think they're like $5 a piece or something. And they will hold quite happily liquid nitrogen such that it looks awesome. Oh, this one's struggling. There we go. Beautiful. And as a general rule, the um, the more boiling you see, the worse the insulation is. So these are all actually pretty decent uh, thermos flasks, like this. Yeah, they 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 cool. They're they're not perfect, but they are very, very respectable in the in how well they hold the heat. Oh, cool. So I'll leave links to those in my Amazon store below and this ever. If you really enjoyed the work of this channel and want to support it directly, you can do it through Patreon and uh, thanks for watching. Is that burning? I think that's burning. There we go, one burning diamond. This is gold. Oh, that's so cool!